Gonzalez, can you hear us? I sure can. Excellent. We're really happy to have you here. Um, you've made it just in time. We just went through uh, some of the club business. So thank you again for joining us. Um, I'll give you a quick little introduction, although I don't think you need it. Um, uh, so Assembly um, woman Lorena Gonzalez was elected in 2013 and has been fighting for California's working and middle class. She has authored historic legislation, including allowing millions of uh, Californians the ability to earn paid sick day, uh, introducing automatic voter registration, fighting against uh, the misclassification employees as independent contractors, protecting immigrant communities and more. She is a graduate of Stanford University and has a master's degree from Georgetown University and a law degree from UCLA. It would take me too long to go through the full list, so I'd just stick to that a little bit. The other couple of things that I wanted to do before um, turning it over to you is, first of all, I wanted to um, commend you for your leadership. Um, you bring a lot of passion to the job that you're doing and you um, are outspoken about what you're doing, which is I think sorely missing uh, in the party. So we really appreciate that. And most importantly, you're a voice um, for the working, working class as well as the middle class. So that's always appreciated. Um, I do have a couple of questions that I wanna kind of preview, uh, okay. but we, I'm sure there'll be others, but, um, the first one is about um, uh, this bill I keep hearing about, 1139, the solar bill. Uh, I'll, I'll confess, I don't know much about it. In fact, I found it kind of difficult to find what it actually even is. So I would love for your explanation of what it is, not, not just so much why you're for it, but what it even is. And then um, there, uh, the second one is another topic that everyone here will know that's near and dear to my heart, which is healthcare. So I wanna thank you for being one of the co-authors of uh, CalCare. And, um, but I guess my question, and you can take it, you know, the beginning or at the end or whenever it makes sense. Um, what is the strategy to get this passed given that now it's been tabled? Uh, we want to understand not just that we have a bill, but what is the plan to get that passed. So I'll, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you and thank you again and welcome. Sure, thanks. And it's great to be here with you all. Um, I'll start with the solar bill since there, you know, is suddenly a lot of attention on it. Um, I want to give everybody kind of a background on, on how we got to where we are, uh, which will, of course is missing in the discussion. So early on, um, when we wanted to increase solar, rooftop solar, um, we highly incentivized it as we should have. That was the only way we could do it. At the time, the cost for installation was very high. The return was not going to ever get people um, back to where they'd be equal for their investment. And we needed um, that investment. It was one of the strategies to get it carbon neutrality. And so it's an important piece of that. Um, this was, you know, in the 90s, uh, quite a while ago. So we did a rate structure in, in 2000s, um, early in 2000s, a rate structure that really did subsidize people who were willing to get solar. You know, we had tax credits along with subsidies um, for what you're putting the grid. Uh, along the way, the CPUC realized those subsidies probably weren't quite right. So they did what, so that's called net metering. And, and it's basically what the, what the utilities um, will pay for your, for what you're putting into the grid. Um, they redid that uh, with NEM2. That was probably um, about 2015. Before that went into place, though, in 2013, uh, the legislature realized in, in some of the reports coming out that the subsidies, um, the way that they were structured, really was a problem because what was happening is solar was being placed on um, middle and uh, well, really upper middle class and, and, and upper class folks who own their house and could afford it, um, the upfront cost, even though they were getting subsidized. And the shift from what they were paying was being put on every other rate payer. Uh, as we continue to build solar, that shift becomes more so. For example, in San Diego, if you're an SDG&E customer, um, if you are, if you don't have solar and, and don't forget most renters in my district, of course, about half renters can't get solar. They have no 
option to, um, you're paying about $220 a year to subsidize people who got solar. So, um, you know, I have solar in my house. Uh, I, I'm a big believer in rooftop solar, but I also um, know that it's kind of unfair if I have a negative bill and my constituents and my neighbors are actually getting burdened um, to pay my fair share of the grid cost and to pay um, for the energy that I get to sell back um, at a retail rate to sdg e even though um, they normally would buy it at a wholesale rate by other renewable energy sources. So um, in 2013, the legislature told the CPUC, hey, you got to work this out. This isn't working because as more people get solar, that burden is only going to increase. And so what we're paying now in San Diego, what anyone without solar is paying, that $220 a year extra that you're paying to subsidize solar users is just going to grow. Um, the CPUC has been sitting on that and um, working its way through it for eight years. So what my bill does is say, all right, come on, CPUC, you act or we will. You have until February 2022. Now, it's a phase in. If you already got solar and you, you, know, you signed a contract thinking I, it's going to pay for itself, you still have that 10 years to, for it to pay for itself. But it says on new customers, we got to figure out a new way. Now, in between that time, we passed a, a bill. In fact, I was the, the joint author and the um, assembly jockey to pass it, and that was to ensure that we're going to 100% renewable. And so some people will say, well, you're killing rooftop solar, which I'm not killing. I, I will still have it. Every new house built will still have it. People who want it and want to do right by the environment can still have it. But most of our renewables are now coming from um, a much cheaper source, and that's some of the big renewable farms that we have, whether they're solar or wind, um, constructed and operated with union labor. They're paying good wages. Our, our rooftop solar people, for the most part, are not. Um, and so, and it's a, at a much cheaper rate. And in fact, on most weekends, midday, we're, we're using about 94% renewable energy. Um, and so, you know, we've come to a time in life when we have to review whether rooftop solar, uh, continued growth in rooftop solar, which burdens those people who can never have rooftop solar is the way to go, or if we look at uh, broader, bigger uh, renewable sources. Now, that being said, we're still going to have rooftop solar. There are still people who want to do it like me, you know, it'll take me, I don't know, six to eight years to pay it off and I'll get a little extra and I'll still, I'll still save on my energy bill because uh, I'll still be producing um, uh, extra extra energy that goes back onto the grid. It's all very complicated how it's done, but what we're saying in this bill, and if you look at the analysis of the bill is we just, working families can't continue to take on the subsidy and it's only going to grow. So we, we're talking about billions of dollars that are shifted from solar um, generators to um, the cost being borne by uh, rate payers. So like for me, for example, I don't pay for the grid, even though I rely on the grid at any time the sun's not out, right? I still have to rely on the grid to get my energy when I'm not producing energy. And yet I don't pay for that. Uh, somebody else is paying my burden um, and, and I'm getting paid for, for solar at a higher rate than it's worth at the time of day that it's being generated. So um, I know it, it sounds, you know, at first blush that in, in really there's this huge campaign because solar companies get sweat. They're big business too. In fact, um, one of the biggest solar companies is owned by Elon Musk. So they put a bunch of money and unfortunately, um, I think really gotten into the minds of people that somehow what we're trying to have dirty energy, we're not, uh, we're committed and in fact have to go to 100% renewable. Um, I just can't continue to support a situation where um, the working class and, and um, poor people in my district are paying for, uh, quite frankly, people in Rancho Santa Fe to have solar rooftops. Um, and if you look, it is a huge difference. The number of people in an area like Rancho Santa Fe that have invested in, in solar uh, is about 15%. If you look in my district, it's less than 1%. So um, it, you know, it, it's not a comfortable thing to talk about. It's not a comfortable thing to do, but it's a discussion that we have to have. And at the end of the day, if we can get to 100% renewable and we can get to our goals without burdening poor people, I think we have a responsibility to do it. So that's the solar one. I don't know if there's any questions on that. Um, but it, it's, uh, trust me, when IBW came to me to take it, I knew I was getting a fight. I didn't know that, you know, I'd be somehow deemed, uh, you know, despite my 100% voting record for Sierra Club and League of Conservation voters, somehow I'm, I'm suddenly, you know, out to kill renewable energy. That's absolutely not true. Um, the other you asked about is healthcare. Now, I'm glad you asked about this. 
we do need a long-term story, a long-term strategy, and we haven't had one. And I think that that's something that we have to, as a community who want single payer to get together and do. Um, it'd be nice if we could just force it down everybody's throat because that's the right thing to do. Again, you know, when you're on the right side, it's easy to say, we'll just do it, we'll figure it out. But in reality, um, there's a lot of obstacles and I would like to see us uh, first apply to the federal government for the waiver we'll need to get there. So we need a waiver for our Medi-Cal funds to be able to spend them in a way that um, through single payer, that is the first hurdle to getting single payer. Like, because we're trying to get all the way there, we're not getting the little pieces done along the way that we need to get there where we think we're going. Um, the good news in this year's budget and this year's, I think, legislature is we're going to going to extend um, health care to undocumented seniors who um, are over 60 years old. And that's huge. This is a huge thing that as a Latino caucus member, we've been working on um, for years now to keep expanding that pool of the very uh, working poor who, who actually can access Medi-Cal. We also um, had a bill go through that allow kids to, if they're purchasing insurance and they have a dependent parent to put them on. So we're kind of tackling, we've tackled some of the youth issues. Um, we're tackling some of the senior issues, but look, we know the pro, the overall healthcare system is unsustainable. We know that we have to get to, to um, health for all and to single payer. How do we get there is a question. And I think we've got to really um, have some honest discussions about some non-sexy bills to get there, right? We're not going to get the whole the whole thing in one swoop. So how do we make how do we make progress over the next, you know, whether it's hopefully under the Biden administration where we can actually get a waiver. If we had tried to under um, under uh, Trump, there was no way we were going to. But we could. I do think it'd be interesting to to proactively ask the federal government if we could get that waiver. That would be step one, so that we can move on to step two, so we could move on to step three, um, and really have this discussion in a way that's meaningful and not just pass something that we can't implement. I'll save my follow up questions for later because I want to give everybody a chance. But it, was there any other? I think we had a couple other topics in general. I don't know if you want to speak to them or you want to go straight to questions. There was I, income inequality, yeah. uh, justice inequality, police reform, uh, uh, other topics. I don't know if more you want to step in here, but. All yeah. good ones. Um, and ones, of course, income inequality is the one that I focus the most on. Um, obviously, I, I come out of organized labor. Um, I, I actually believe that so many of our societal ills would be um, I don't want to say completely erased, but we'd make major progress, whether we're talking about health care or housing or all the problems that we're seeing the homeless, if we simply paid people what they were due for a hard day's work. And unfortunately, we still don't do that. I feel like I've carried countless bills now. We've increased the minimum wage. We've done um, sick days. We're trying to expand sick days. We're going to continue to take on. Um, I, I, I've been supportive, of course, of, of, of the wealth tax and um, ensuring that you know people pay their fair share. Uh, but we have to continue to ensure that jobs are good jobs. Right now we have a bill to take on Amazon warehouses, which is really important in San Diego. There is a proposal for a warehouse to go in in El Cajon and the largest Amazon warehouse in North America is being built right now in my district, right on the border. So we really need some protections, not only, you know, Amazon will say, well, we do well, we pay our, our we start at $15 an hour, um, our workers, they're, they're doing just fine. But in fact, an Amazon warehouse, um, we know the injury rates in an Amazon warehouse are two times that of any other warehouse because of what they're expected to do so quickly and three times that of any other dangerous job. So we, we have a, a bill to deal with um, some of those issues. I, I think that's equally important that we, we make sure people are safe at work. Um, along with being paid well, and they need to be paid more. So um, income inequality is one of those things that really, I think, drives me. And in particular, income inequality, um, uh, it's problematic on a lot of issues. But if you could at least stem in making sure that big corporations are paying their workers what they deserve and giving them the right to unionize, I think we get pretty far on a lot of other things. So um, I've spent eight years working on these issues and will continue to. Um, it's what drives me every day, the result of, of being raised by a single mom who worked her ass off, quite frankly. You know, um, a 60 hour week was a luxury. She, she, uh, you know, worked two, sometimes three jobs. And, you know, anyone who works that hard should be able to get ahead. They shouldn't be struggling to pay the bills. And um, so let's start with the most obvious thing we should be able to to rally around, although it's 
increasingly hard to get the companies to decide that that's a good idea, but um, that's where a lot of my focus has been. So, and of course, um, we've done a lot on police reform. We're going to continue to do it. I have a bill um, on the floor of the assembly to take on uh, some of the stuff that we saw, in fact, in La Mesa last year, the, the rubber bullets issue, um, police shooting indiscriminately what they say are non-lethal weapons at protesters, things like bean bags and um, projectiles, spraying tear gas, making sure that they're they're properly trained in it, that they give adequate warnings and that they don't um, aim towards anybody's head. You can't take a non-lethal, supposedly non-lethal weapon and, and weaponize it in a close to lethal way and, and suggest that you're doing something not harmful. So we've got some um, going on that. And then we have, I think this year, it's not my bill, but I, I really do think we'll get a decertification process for bad police officers. So finally, when we need one. So those are kind of some of the things. I don't know what individually, I, I feel like people always have specific questions. I'm more than happy to answer any of them. Well, Mr. Oh, President, well, if I, I, I can yeah. ask a specific question. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, welcome assembly member. My name is Sharia Afshar. I'm the former president of the club and we've met once or twice at yes when I was with the port and uh, when you came to the Persian Cultural Center, thank you so much for all you've done and your participation in these things. Uh, actually, as a special needs parent, uh, what I wanted to just kind of uh, kind of plant a seed uh, in your office is the work of uh, my fellow advocates, uh, Marisol Rubio from Northern California, who's joining us, and Julianne Neward. Uh, both uh, have loved ones that are special needs and they're working hard to uh, get uh, Marisol's role, and I want to turn it over to her to ask kind of a follow-up question. Mar Marisol's role is to help uh, caregivers get, get living wage, mm -hmm. uh, which is obviously <laughs> very familiar uh, territory. And uh, Julie uh, wants transparency in some of these care facilities that take care yep. of our loved ones. So uh, the three of us are kind of bound together. Uh, in that way, and we're trying to do whatever we can uh, to help them. And this club has just endorsed a couple of the resolutions that they've adopted, uh, which the California Democratic Resolutions Committee just adopted uh, recently. So uh, with that introduction, I kind of wanted to maybe turn it over to Julie for a quick hello, unless uh, Mons, you want to segue into something? No? Okay. Continue. Uh, Julie, if you want to just say hello and Hi, Assemblywoman Gonzalez. My name's Julie. I actually live over here in San Marcos. I moved from Northern oh. California where Mari Sol is in Walnut Creek. Um, Shariar, thank you so much for teeing us up. I really appreciate it. And again, it's an honor for Mari Sol and I to be here. We, we do have a resolution that was uh, recently endorsed by the California Democratic Party at the convention. Um, quite simply, the personal story, this woman that's next to me is a Me Too survivor with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It's my sister, Natalie. Um, she was being sexually assaulted at her outside caretaking facility. And I have to use the, those very specific words because there's a secret settlement. Um, the secret settlement, as you know, is paid by the facility. These facilities are funded with taxpayer dollars. So essentially we as taxpayers are covering up an epidemic of sexual assault amongst one of our, and I have to be very careful, one of our most vulnerable populations. Um, NPR featured my sister's story under, she can't tell us what's wrong because my sister is nonverbal. Um, she, she has high support needs. She's similar to a 10 month old baby. That's what her support needs are. Diapers, feeding, um, she's full-time care. Uh, my mother is now a single mother, like Mari Sol is as well, caring for my sister. And when my sister was raped, we had to take her out of her facility and we kept her home for four years straight without any services or supports. And we relied on the system. And we also fell through every crack in the system. The um, criminal case is still very wide open. The civil settlement quickly happened. They gave us money, told us to be quiet. I'm not a quiet person, okay? <laughs> I'm not gonna stay quiet. Uh, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are sexually assaulted at a rate seven times that of the general public. That's the highest rate and women are 12 times and it's multiple times. And many of the families that I speak with did sign a non-disclosure agreement. And I know Senator Leva, she did bill SB 820, which is an awesome segue, but we need more transparency into the abuse and to the abuse that's being settled by these facilities with taxpayer dollars, because essentially we as taxpayers are covering this up. Mm -hmm. um, we need more awareness and we need risk reduction measures. And that's what this resolution and our goal with legislation is all about. 
So do you have a current bill or just the resolution? We have a resolution right now and I can segue to Marisol. Okay. Hello, Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Como esta? Bien, bien. Mucho gusto verla. We, I know we met a long time ago, so it's a pleasure to see you again. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for having us here. Um, Assemblywoman, uh, what, what I, I've been particularly advocating for, I've been a caregiver for my daughter who's a brain cancer survivor now for 25 years. Um, and in that process have had to deal with a, a, just a whole host of institutions, well, big institutions, education, uh, healthcare, um, as well as and doing this, uh, trying to go to college and getting my degree in neurobiology and, you know, just really doing this and doing this on my own because my family was did not live nearby. So um, really had to kind of go through the ringer and it was very challenging. I mean, emotionally, physically, psychologically, every every dimension of health was was being challenged simultaneously. And um, for, you know, what I did early in my uh, educational career is start to do research on caregivers and their health status and found out some really uh, just shocking statistics about our health. I'm not sure if you're familiar with some research that was done at Stanford, your alma mater. <laughs> <laughs> um, they uh, did some really important research on caregivers and actually found out that their cellular aging was at six times the rate of single parents. And most of these caregivers, these high stress caregivers like myself, are dying, losing up to 10 years of life in the work that we do. Right. And as you know, up until very recently, I mean, we were, we were getting paid about $13.50 an hour. And they just recently bumped it up to $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. And many of us are not getting, are, are, are finding it very difficult to find full-time status because as you know, many of the hours <coughs> aren't counted. Mm -hmm. Things that we're doing it are just not counted. Um, so, and then fortunately, the, the, as you know, the governor you know, temporarily put a halt on that 7% cut to consumer hours, but we still have to make that permanent. Yeah. And um, uh, you and I, I mean, I, I, we're both very pro-labor. <laughs> I'm, I'm an SEIU 2015 union member. And, um, you know, I, I'm just, I feel like we really have to take this opportunity right now that the government has put forward a huge grant for caregivers. Uh, of He's supporting, uh, putting some funding behind that. And um, in my resolution, I really uh, highlighted a lot of statistics, research that I've done since 2004, um, uh, talking about the health status that really illustrates that these aren't just people complaining. This is literally people who are dying in the process of doing work that has enormous economic value, 58 billion just here in California. So, um, you know, what we'd like to see, we understand that the work that Julie and I do is, is really sort of the yin and the yang of the situation. I, I've been the caregiver, Julie has been a caregiver to her sister, but a sibling, uh, from that perspective of sibling, and we are both, um, you know, we understand that Tay, by caring for the caregiver, you're also providing better care for the recipient, right. and um, and that's even also been um, widely researched. Uh, there was a re recent research that was done on that, showing that. Um, in 2016, 2017, they found that 13 out of 103 deaths among disabled persons were due to treatment delays, neglect, or abuse. And so it, it is really important and um, that we, you know, this is uh, that we do something about it because people are dying, both right. from, from both sides of this issue. And uh, my resolution, we, I actually co-authored with Julie, the one of the one resolution that was prioritized, which we're super excited about. The other resolution has um, is going to be reaffirmed in the e-board. There was a little bit of a processing issue, so that we have to do it in in August. But um, both of them are um, were well received uh, at this point from the party, and we would love to have an opportunity to discuss further with you um, those issues and the nuanced ish, uh, you know, prior. Uh, talking points about that. I just feel free to come see me in my office um, and, and we can discuss it. I've been obviously a longtime supporter. My 
of UDW. That's what we have in our in our area and of the caregivers there. Um, well versed, obviously, even before I came here. And the actual cost savings that we we get as a state, if people are willing to stay home and care for their loved ones, it actually um, costs less. And as Julie pointed out, is less dangerous, obviously, um, for for the individual. I mean, we have some real problems at our long term care facilities um, that just I think uh, I'm hopeful post pandemic that it's something we take seriously. I know I've um, put in a couple bills to deal with some of the abuse issues, but not nearly enough. And secret set. I mean, I know there was maybe a Brian Mainshine bill a few years ago, I think, yeah. Um, the secret settlement issue is huge. Uh, we've tried to take it on on a variety of things. You know, there are two words, that, there are two things that we should always be aware of when people are talking about arbitration outside of outside of union arbitration, but um, mandatory arbitration and secret settlements. That is how abusers hide. Um, and it's something that we continue to have to fight both at the state level. There's only so much we can do about arbitration because that's a national, we're usually federally preempted, but the secret settlement issue is one that um, no matter what you're talking about, if a settlement is secret, there's a reason why somebody wants to keep it secret and it usually is to protect the abuser. Um, and so, uh, you know, anytime a victim wants something secret, we should, we should do that we should respect that but but if there is a desire to speak out and there often is that's how you get change um we should tackle that as well but as far as our caregivers our home health care workers and caregivers um we have to do more uh bottom line is we have an aging population and it should be seen as a benefit when a family member is willing to stay home and care for that individual because it does save the state money and it's the best situation for the individual we know that um and so it's something that we've got to tackle moving forward with with an aging population and with the struggles you know sometimes it's a daughter or a sibling um my my uh cousin takes care of her son has been a home health care worker um her whole life as well her whole professional life, if you will. Um, and that's a big sacrifice, you know, and before we jump, I always say before we jump to things like, and I'm not suggesting that UBI is an important or stuff, but paying people to not work, um, we should pay people for the work they're currently doing. We, we should allow moms who stay home with their children to be paid a living wage. We should have caretakers be paid a living wage, because it's actually in the long run, saving the state money. And we shouldn't be talking uh, until we we compensate people for the work they're doing, we shouldn't be talking about some just, you know, pain a little bit and making people go away and not have to worry about them. So I'm all in, um, come to my office, we can talk. I'd be more than happy if you're looking for next year for um, something specific, even looking to, to author a bill, so. Great, thank you so much, Assemblywoman. We truly appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, well, so thank you guys. You're doing like the Lord's work. I mean, that's all I can say. It, it's really, um, I, I, I just, you know, I can't imagine. And so, and, and I can't imagine making the difficult choice that often, you know, somebody can't take care of somebody and putting them into a long term um, care facility is the only thing you can do. And then not having the safety requirements and, and the, the transparency that is necessary is just heartbreaking. I, I just, it is unacceptable. So right. Thank we you. Definitely need um, to do thank let, you. Let me, I know we're running short on time. I think Amira had one more question. Amira, do you still have your hand up? I mean, I know you don't, but maybe no, you did. I'm, I'm good. You, it, it that's was just maybe the place. last question since we're running short on time. Um, yeah, I'm gonna pass. <laughs> okay, then maybe I'll, if there's no other question, I'd like to jump in with my follow-up. Okay. For, um, for healthcare. So um, can you just maybe elaborate a little bit about what we on the ground can or should be doing uh to make this happen because let me just tell you how disheartening this is yeah. when we see um two consecutive uh, terms with super super majority of democrats in office and now we even have as you said um the former attorney general of california anthony or uh, javier uh, becerra mm -hmm. who's a you know lifelong supporter of medicare for all and willing to do the waivers um maybe you could just like you to elaborate a little more about what are the next steps as you see it and what can we the people on the ground do to push this thing forward in california we're doing it federally but right. we just that's a separate track but at the state level what is it that we can do 
So uh, I don't want to diminish what we need to do federally. Obviously, this would be a lot easier if we could get it nationally, right? Because when you talk about California and the cost burdens, um, and I, I even had a long discussion with Ash Kalra, who was carrying the bill this year. Um, look, I got a, a, you know, as chair of appropriations, I can't, the, the system is set up, so I do not, I, I do not push forward a bill that costs $4 billion without understanding where that money, or 40 billion, I'm sorry, without understanding where that money is coming from, we have to have a source. We've got to decide um, a number of things, how we reach that goal, right? And we all know if we pass it, it it's a cost shift, if you will, that money will come up because we're spending so much. But unfortunately, the way we do the process is you've got to identify the funding source beforehand. So I think the, um, I really, even if it's, you know, I, I wish we could just have this year pass something on, on asking for the waiver because then that gets a big chunk of it out, right? Then we're talking like, and I don't know the exact, I don't have the cost breakout in front of me. So if we could get a bill even this year or you know as soon as possible to say, okay, we're gonna ask federal government for the waiver. I don't know how long that'll take, but we'll get a waiver. And that'll tell us how much more we'll need to, um, to tackle in order to get it because it really is now a process thing, right? Um, it, it's disheartening because we, we were talking about it when no one was talking about it, it was unrealistic or whatever. Uh oh, it's realistic. So how do we go through a process by which it can actually be achieved? And I want to have that discussion. The problem is we can't have that discussion when the big bill's out there because everybody just wants the big bill, which I understand. I want it too, you know. But it's like okay, okay. So we couldn't get that this year. What what piece can we take care of so that we're we're cutting away at the excuses to not have it? That's what I want to see if we can't get it done. Um, I also think. You know, this year became really weird because we didn't want to talk about taxes because we have this huge budget surplus, right? And so no one wants to talk about taxes, but we've got to talk about the, the structural changes that need to be made long term. Healthcare expenditures should be paid for in taxes and to, to fund Medicare for all. And we've got to talk about that. Another piece we've got to deal with, and this is real, this isn't like, um, I, I thought so much about all these little pieces that hey, let's take them piece by piece. The other piece is um, doctors and dentists loan repayments, right? We've got a bunch of doctors and dentists with huge um, loans. Now I wanna leave everybody a student debt, but part of the healthcare for all and Medicare for all has to be like, how do we relieve our doctors and dentists of their long-term loans and ensure that nobody else is graduating from medical school with those um, types, with that type of debt. It doesn't fit with a Medicare for all kind of, um, uh, structure. So I want to take this as an opportunity to step back and say, what are all these little pieces? And it's much, we should probably get together people who are really interested in working on the same. How many different pieces are this? And if we can get all the frame there, so we're taking care of everything that somebody throws out there is a reason to not do it. Then, then what do we have left? Do it, you know? And so um, I, I think those folks who kind of the corporate medical folks who don't want it, they, they, they um, hide behind all these excuses. So let's start tackling all the excuses one by one so that we can bring it up um, and say, okay, now what, you know, we've shown you. So I, I guess that's not as specific. And I, I, to be honest, I wish I'd come, I had a list because I've been thinking about this every time this bill gets introduced. And then, um, you know, I, like I said, I went to Osh and I said, hey, if we're not going to have it, can we turn it into this? Well, nobody wants to feel like they're settling, right? Nobody wants to feel, well, okay, but let's ask the federal government for that waiver. Let's knock that piece out and we get a waiver. And then, you know, you're cutting a lot of the money, a lot of the costs then out of the bill. That would be great. That's a step forward. What can we do to do a step forward besides just we have a commission and stuff that in recommendations that are coming, but that's what I'd like to see. If I'm, if my information is correct, nationally, we pay about two thirds of it is already publicly funded. It's just that extra one third that we need to come up with at the national level. And I imagine California is, is something similar to that. Probably similar. Yeah. Yeah. But, but right. we've got to not give up too. Some of this is like, look, coming out of organized labor, and I know a lot of people probably even on this call have been working on this a long time, but coming out of organized labor, the one thing that I learned is like, you just got to 
outlive hopefully the opponents. I mean, it's like piece by piece. If you look at young people today, they're demanding these changes. This is a difference, you know, where we're seeing change. Change doesn't come as quickly as we'd like, but when um, but when the when the ball starts to roll, then we'll be there and we'll be ready. Um, but it's not giving up and saying, oh, that was that year. We talked about it, you know, I'm done with it now. We cannot be done with it. We have to keep moving forward. Makes sense. Well, thank you again. I think we're out of time. So I want to thank you once again for taking the time to speak with us. And we'd love to have you here again in thank the future. You. Anytime. And so I've, it's Ella in my staff. I see her on here. So um, she can send you to, she'll, she'll send you our information. Everybody wants to come in and talk about policy. Um, right now is a busy time, but you know, there are times of the year, especially after September, looking for that next year after September is when we're writing bills um, for our office. We, we know what we're going to do by December. So sometimes people start looking around January, February, too late for us. We know by December kind of what we're doing. So if there are ideas or things you want us to tackle or, or strategies to sit through and talk about, come to us in that September, October, November time and, and let's figure it out. Sounds great. All right. Well, thanks again. And uh, you. enjoy your evening. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. All right.